Good morning, church, uh, and good morning to all those of you who are joining us online. Uh, we are blessed to have you here today. As you uh, can see, we are led in worship by our wonderful Westminster Strings, and they will be filling this sanctuary with beautiful music as we do indeed sing a new song to our God. Um, and this is the season of Lent, and we are blessed to have you here, but uh, also want to encourage you on Wednesday nights. We are still uh, participating in our Lenten series, uh, The Footsteps of the Savior, and uh, we have our meals. Uh, this week, uh, the men are going to be preparing a baked potato bar for you all. Um, I went and purchased the baked potatoes. They're about the size of a football each. Um, so you won't be going home hungry, uh, but we do encourage you to come and join us. Uh, it is a wonderful time, and then we have a Vespers service following that. Um, we also want to highlight some other announcements. Uh, our Easter egg, now our, our Easter event is coming up um, on the 30th. We need a lot of candy, so uh, let's get that candy going. And we have places in the back for you to drop that off during the week or on Sunday mornings. Um, and let me see, any other announcements? Um, Oh, uh, next Sunday, uh, I shouldn't forget this, it's uh, one of the highlights of the year, uh, Minnesota Adult Teen Challenge will be joining us, and they are, uh, come every year during March, and they um, really bring an, an amazing spirit. They will lead the worship, they will sing songs, they will tell stories. Uh, these, some, they do contain adult themes, obviously with addiction and struggles, uh, so we will have options for the younger kids if the parents want to send them down um, for a time of their own, uh, but we feel it's an appropriate message for all, so uh, it is a wonderful time. Following that, we will participate in a meal with them. We are doing a, an egg bake brunch. You still have an opportunity to sign up to bring egg bakes, uh, but we also need a lot of people to help serve and clean up. So we have sign-up sheets available in the Fellowship Hall, and we encourage you uh, to, to look to see how you can help with that, because it is a wonderful event. Uh, lastly, uh, following the service today, we are all invited into the Fellowship Hall uh, for a cake celebration for Lonnie Schultz, celebrating his 85th birthday, um, and so I uh, just encourage you to do that uh, during the Fellowship Hour. And so now with that, uh, let us continue to worship our Lord and Savior in spirit and in truth. Please stand as we sing our gathering hymns, We Come, O Christ, to You, verses 1 and 2, hymn number 110, and then also, I Come to the Cross, hymn number 251. So please stand as we sing to our one God with one voice.
Let us pray. Our dear God, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for bringing us all together to worship you. We're truly blessed to live in a nation where we can openly praise and honor you. We humbly ask that you soften our hearts and open our minds so we can hear and feel the message of your love and mercy. Help us to understand that you are for us and that you are with us always. Teach us to hand over all our worries to you and to be anxious for nothing. Lord, we are grateful for the beautiful music today and we ask that you bless our pastors and their words this morning. In your glorious name we pray, amen. Please be seated. Our Old Testament lesson uh, this morning comes from Ezekiel, chapter 36, verses 30, 24 through 30, and can be found in the Pew Bibles on page 805. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and let you be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the grain and make it plentiful and will not bring famine upon you. I will increase the fruit of the trees and the crops of the field so that you will no longer suffer disgrace among the nations because of famine. We thank God for his word this morning. Amen.
Well, we do thank our Westminster Strings again for leading us in worship this morning. And now we do get to come before our God with our prayer and praise, and I will direct you to that portion of your bulletin. And we do have one to add. Uh, Gordy Briggs had some skin cancer removed, and they found that no chemo was needed, so we are praising God for that. But are there other prayers and praises we can lift to our God? All right, well, let us go to our God in prayer. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for the gift of this day. We thank you for the love and mercy and grace that you pour out on us. And God, as we continue through this season of Lent, we ask that you draw us closer to you. Help remind us of your love and let us be faithful to you. And God, hear us now during this time of silent meditation. God, you know all that is on our hearts, so we thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. And we lift up to you Vandy Newman, who was in a serious car accident and is now recovering at St. Mark's. And God, we just ask for continued recovery and healing for her. We lift up to you Kim Potter's nephew, Nick, who has been diagnosed with epilepsy. We ask that you be with him and help give him strength and peace. We lift up to you, Matt Taylor, recovering from an appendectomy. And God, we thank you that it went well and just ask for continued healing. We lift up to you, Cindy Gaskison, who is continuing to heal from her fall. And God, we just ask that you surround her in your healing hands and giving her strength. We lift up to you, Jim Jays, as his wet macular degeneration has progressed to the other eye. And God, ask that you be with him as well and give him your healing. We lift up to Georgianne Simonson, recovering from surgery and awaiting biopsy results, as well as her daughter, Terry. God, we praise you that she is feeling better. We lift up to you Deanna's nephew, Axel, who is recovering from hernia surgery, and ask that this continues to heal. We lift up to you the Olmstead's friend, Corey Geving, who is recovering after a double mastectomy last week. God, just ask for continued healing in her life. We lift up to you the Onensen's grandson, Memphis, who has warts on his heels and ask for healing for him. And we lift up to you Caitlin Zinn, who will be receiving a new kidney. We ask that this surgery goes smoothly and that you help heal her. And God, we also lift up to you Gordy Briggs. We thank you that the skin cancer was removed and that no chemo is needed. And we also like to lift up these people in our church family that we prayed for during our last staff meeting. And so, God, we lift up to you Dan and Melissa Armagost family, Luke Burhow, John and Beverly Bridgman, Colin and Renee Clennon, Alta Gaines, Chrissy and Alan Gaskell family, June Genrich, Shirley Guy, Brooke Hamilton, Don and Kim Neistel family, Dave and Marianne Rasmussen, Drew and Trish Siskowski family, Bob and Linda Watson, and Dwayne and Stephanie Wilkinson. And so God, we do lift these beloved children of yours up to you and ask an extra blessing on them this week. And now we ask God that you hear us as we pray the Lord's Prayer, which can be found on the screen behind me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now uh, I'd like to invite our ushers forward for this morning's offering. And as they come forward, let us remember that every good and perfect gift comes from our God. And so God, we ask that you take 
these gifts and that you use them for your kingdom purposes so that others may know of your glory and your love. Amen. And now I can urge you to remain stand. Sorry, I'm having trouble with words. Uh, greet each other with the peace of Christ. As you return to your pews, I'd like to invite all the children forward. Come on. Hi, Jack. Hello, hello, hello. How is everybody? Good, awesome. It's good to see you all this morning. So I have a question for you. Who here likes to read? Yeah? All right, what is your favorite book? Harry Potter 7. Harry Potter 7. How about you? Do you have a favorite book? 
Anyone else have a favorite book? Yeah. Uh, the, attack, the Attack of the Killer Bees. The Attack of the Killer Bees? Bunnies. Bunnies. Oh, killer bunnies. Oh, no. So close to Easter. That's frightening. <laughs> so you want to know my favorite book as a kid? What? Have you ever read this? Yes. The Very Hungry Little Caterpillar? So... I always loved this book because it was about a caterpillar who could eat and eat and eat and eat. And boy, I loved that. I was like, I want to be that caterpillar and eat plums and apples and watermelon and peaches and everything else, right? And everything else. But I think this story is a good example about a story we're going to hear today in Scripture. So some guy comes to Jesus, and he's like, what can I do? What can I do to like inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, you must be born again of the Spirit. Now, how are you born again? Right? Or like, how does that work? But do you remember how the caterpillar becomes a butterfly? Mm-hmm. How? He eats. He eats, and then what does he do? Then he He turns into a cocoon and he wraps himself all up. Wraps himself. And then he turns into a butterfly. And then he turns into a butterfly. But he can't skip the stage of being wrapped in a cocoon, right? Mm -hmm. That has to happen. Why? Why? That's just how it works, I think. That's how God made it. He has to have a transition stage. And for us, being wrapped in that cocoon is like being wrapped in God's love. So we're all like little caterpillars. And then God comes and he wraps us in his spirit and his love and his grace and his mercy. And then you know what we become? We become like butterflies. Because of God's love that has changed us and turned us from a caterpillar into a butterfly. Isn't that pretty cool? Y'all happy to be butterflies? Y'all like the cocoon of God's love? Awesome. Well, let's pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for your love, and we thank you for changing our lives and helping us to be more like you. And all God's children said, amen. All right, and now you can join Miss Emma in the back if you're up to second grade for for Sunshine Singers. Thank you, Britt. And as all those little butterflies fly away, um, you can uh, turn to uh, John. Uh, it's going to be our uh, lesson this morning, John 3, uh, 1 through 17. There's a verse in there that I want to surprise you with. Some of you have probably never read it or heard it, um, but it is John three sixteen. 16. Uh, this is one of the beloved scriptures that we have um, in which God truly shares uh, his truth uh, about a a new birth and uh, what uh, that saving love and that saving presence can do. And so we're going to be reading from uh, John 3, 1 through 17. And um, I will um, read with you. It's on page 93. So I encourage you to open there and uh, Stay open throughout the sermon, and we'll refer back to the text. So now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Well, Jesus answered him, very truly I tell you, No one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter the second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I say to you, you must be born from above. 
The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Well, Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe. How can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for your word this morning. May it indeed speak to our hearts and our minds as your truth is illuminated within us. And may we then go and share that truth with the world around us. So be with us today and bless our hearing of your word this morning. Amen. Well, uh, many of you know that I'm a, a movie buff. Uh, I enjoy seeing movies. Actually, went out and saw Dune 2 um, this past weekend. Pretty good movie for your sci-fi uh, uh, people out there. Uh, but I came across a devotion uh, during our Lenten season from our um, Lenten devotional, which brought me to another sci-fi fantasy movie, uh, The Matrix, uh, back in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, and the first movie, which was the best, the, the rest were kind of, I don't know, um, but uh, I guess I give him a thumbs down. Um, but the, the first movie was about the idea of accepting a different reality, if any of you have seen it. Uh, the main character was a character named Neo, kind of lost in this world, um, and he had been seduced by what was called the Matrix, um, because this was a computer-generated reality which um, kind of tricked people into believing a different and a false reality. And so they were living lives that were controlled and were manipulated for generations and generations. But then as the, the movie kind of gets going, um, Neo had a choice. Uh, one of the main characters, Morpheus, came to him and presented him with an option. And he said he could take the blue pill or the red pill. If you chose the blue pill, you would stay locked into this false truth of this simulated world. But if you chose the red, pill, the red pill, you would be given an opportunity to receive and believe in a new reality that would lead to freedom and hope for him and for the world around him. And in the, one of the classic uh, movie lines, it says, you take the, red, the blue pill and the story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe what you're, whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland. And I show, I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. And so this was the, the thesis of this movie, is that this character had a choice to open up his mind to a new reality or to return to the lies that the world was telling him. If he chose wrong, he would stay stuck in this past life, being none the wiser with no hope for a better future. But if he chose correctly, then he would be born into a new reality, a new freedom, a new hope. And I shared this story and this movie because the same theme is what we encounter in our scripture today. Now, I don't think Christ was there whole, handing up a red pill or a blue pill uh, to Nicodemus. Um, but what he was doing was he was giving Nicodemus a chance to choose to believe in the past teachings of the laws and practices, 
to believe in the old Jewish traditions that were controlling them, to deny the freedom of love and hope that was directly in front of him. Or he could simply choose Jesus Christ as his Savior. And as Christ told him, he would be born again. So as we get into our text, I want to provide a little bit of a background. We are in John chapter 3, fairly early in John's gospel. And and John is weaving a narrative for us um, that will lead us to the cross. But he begins with a foundational understanding of who Christ is in John chapter 2. There are only two stories in the second chapter of John. The first is the wedding, the wedding at Cana, where the, the bridegroom had run out of wine. And so Mary, Christ's mother, came to him and said, um, fix this situation. And after uh, some uh, back and forth, Christ created new wine. He filled up the the pitchers with water that turned into the the best and the sweetest of all wines. So we see this new experience. He is filling up. And then the next story is Christ in the temple. Purifying the temple from those who had uh, turned God's house into a, a den of vipers by selling and charging and manipulating God's children. And so he cleared the temple of all that was taking place there. So we see in John chapter 2, the foundation elements that Christ will fill us with a new wine, a new life. And as he does, he will wash away the old. He will purify us. He will cleanse us from the sin that is in our lives that separates us from Him. And so it is this background that then we encounter Nicodemus. And the reason why Nicodemus is coming to meet Christ is because of what happened in chapter 2. Because Nicodemus is a, uh, he's a Pharisee. And the, the Pharisees were those that were Uh, thought to be 7,000 around the time of Christ that were throughout all of Judea. Uh, They were lay members. They were not professional pastors. uh, But they had the self-imposed, I guess, title that they were the experts in the law. They were the ones that studied. They were the gold standard of religious truth. And in many ways, that was helpful for that society. But in a lot of ways, then they began to enforce the old ways. And they would restrict any new teachings and any new ideas. For that was their job as a Pharisee. That was Nicodemus' job. You can almost imagine he was told by his friends, okay, I hear this stuff going on with this Jesus. Why don't you go meet with him? Hear him out. Give him a chance to explain himself. So that's why Nicodemus was traveling to meet Christ. It also says that Nicodemus was a leader of the Jews, which meant that he was a member, one of 71 members of the esteemed royal council of Jerusalem, the Sanhedrin. They were the ones that decided any legal issues, any religious issues or disputes. They were the final word. And so when Nicodemus comes to Christ, he comes with authority. He comes with uh, an expectation that he was there to approve of what Jesus was doing and what Jesus was saying. And he came in the night. Um, Initially, you think, well, he was probably coming in secrecy uh, because he didn't want other people to know. But I think the real reality was that he was coming at night, so he could have Jesus all to himself. During the day, Christ was surrounded by groups and crowds of people. And this was a time for Nicodemus to sit one-on-one and to learn more about the one that he saw, he acknowledged, was performing these miracles, these miraculous signs. He knew that God had blessed him, but he didn't know to what extent and to truly what he was dealing with. And so he came to Jesus because he wanted to know 
and then he would report back to the Sanhedrin. But Nicodemus would have known the promises that we'd heard about in Ezekiel that Nathan read for us this morning. Those same promises Nicodemus would have studied. The promises of cleansing, of restoration, of transformation. But he and the other religious leaders had not accepted those teachings yet. They did not apply them to Christ. And so now he here, he was with Christ. He was confronted with the Son of God who would literally bring this new birth, a new witness, and a new love into this world. And so let us unpack this passage in which Christ teaches Nicodemus. There is this uh, word that we, we all know of now as, as believers. Uh, it is born again. But hearing that for the first time, as an intelligent, a religious leader, teacher of the law, that Jesus says to get into the new kingdom, you have to be born again? How many of us wouldn't go right to where Nicodemus, Nicodemus went? How is Mike Olmstead at the age of 58 going to be born again? Is he going to go through that birthing process again? And so that's the mindset that Nicodemus came into. His old reality was now being exposed for the lies that it contained. And he wasn't prepared for this. And so he struggled with the word born again. And in religious circles, we are familiar with that now, but we know that um, uh, for me, growing up in the late 70s and early 80s, this was a movement that had started uh, through Billy Graham, um, through Bill Albright, the founder of Campus Crusade, um, really that evangelical approach to, to a rebirth, um, if you will. Because for me, before this rebirth, Christianity was more about practicing a lifestyle. It was about attending church. It was about doing and saying the right things. It was about a performance. But then when Christ truly grabbed hold of me, it was about a new birth. Paul echoes these new births in his, <coughs> in his writings. Listen to Titus, uh, verses, uh, chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, in Paul's letter to his friend. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Not because of any works of righteousness that we have done, but according to His mercy through the water of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. And then we hear in 2 Corinthians, Paul writing to the church in Corinth. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. To enter the kingdom of God, we must receive this new birth. We must be filled by His love, cleansed by His grace, born of both the water and the Spirit. The water was how John the Baptist baptized, wasn't it? In which he cleansed people from their sin by baptizing them within the waters of the River Jordan. But then he promised that Christ would come with a different baptism, a baptism of the Spirit, which would fill our lives, fill our souls, and create us into new beings. That's the baptism that Christ is referring to here. Being born of the water, being born of the Spirit. And for Nicodemus, this was a mind-blowing new reality. It was contrary to all that he knew, all that he had taught, all that he had based his life on. His earthly mind couldn't grasp this new reality, this new birth. But that's who he was confronted with. And Christ told him, in order to receive God's kingdom, you must receive this new birth. 
Then Christ went on to share about a new witness. He was testifying to a new testimony, a new witness. Listen to verse 11. It says, Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen. And you people do not accept our testimony. Christ has come as a new witness of God's love, of God's presence, of all that God is. Jesus Christ came down to be one of us so that he could testify to the truth of our God in heaven. Testify to his truth. That is the new witness that fulfills the old witness of the law. But this new witness must be received and it must also be shared. What does Paul call us later on in Scripture? We are an ambassador of Christ. We are now His witnesses. We carry on this, uh, this eternal witness by how we live as believers and how we share who God is to others. And so there is a new witness that is emerging. And then finally, there is a new love. A revolutionary love that has now been given. I wonder if you will um, repeat with me uh, verse 16. I'm putting you on the spot here, but if you don't know, just kind of mumble along. But let's say together verse 16, and if you have your scriptures opened. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son so that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. might help if I read it in the same translation of all of you, but uh, um, it means the same. That is this new love. For God so loved. What an amazing statement that is. It is personal. It is endearing. It is never-ending. It is unconditional. It is ever creating. That is how God loved. With all that He is, He's given to us. Because He says that He gave. The word gave speaks to a concrete historical reality. This gift has been given and it can never be taken away. That is the love that God has given. It is not in theory. It is a practical love that will sustain us and guide us. So that whoever believes, this gift is meant for all, but it is received only by some. That's the difficult part to hear, is that there are some that are going to hear this message, but they're not going to receive it. But we know it is a message that is given to everyone and each person has their own personal choice to believe. And as we believe, we will not perish but have eternal life. Our God is just. He is righteous. But He is also merciful. He is forgiving. He will welcome us home into His presence. Because He came so that this gift might, he might save the world through Him. That is God's ultimate desire. To save humanity. To give us a new choice. To allow us to be born into a new reality. A new creation. To live in a new witness. To share that witness with others. And to love, to be loved with a new love. And again, to give that love to those around us. That's the message that God gives to Nicodemus. And that's the message that he gives to each of us. And in closing, <coughs> I want to share that uh, as, as I was preparing for the sermon, I, I came across a devotional uh, with an intriguing title. It says, The Other, John 3.16. Well, immediately it caught my attention, and so I dug a little deeper. And I know that uh, John the Evangelist, he also wrote his... Uh, um, the letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He wrote Revelations. Um, 
And he was the original author of John 3.16. But what was this other John 3.16? Well, as I read the devotion, I quickly discovered that there is a 1 John 3.16. And I don't know if it's a coincidence. Nothing in God is a coincidence. But this 1 John 3.16 carries on the message. Listen to what it says in 1 John. This is how we know what love is. That Jesus Christ laid down His life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and truth. That's the continuation of the message that Christ has given to Nicodemus. We don't know the response of Nicodemus in this chapter. There are hints in the rest of John's Gospel. In chapter 7, he defends Christ in front of the Sanhedrin and says, "Um, uh, we, we can't bring a man to trial without charges. And then he, along with Joseph of Arimathea, takes Christ off the cross and prepares his body for burial in the empty tomb. So we have an assumption that Nicodemus' life was born again. But we too have that same choice. We can choose to live in the love that Christ has laid for us. A love that cost him his life. That he laid down for you and he laid down for me. And the way that we choose to live in that love is to share it with our brothers and sisters in this world. How can we look at people in need? How can we look at people who are hurting? How can we look at people who are struggling with so many issues and not respond if we say that we have the love of God within us? That's our calling. That's our challenge as believers is to accept this new birth, this new witness, and this new love. So that we can help create a new reality in someone else's life. Let us go forth living in this gospel truth. So that we can show a new birth, a new witness, and a new love to those around us. And we can choose to follow after Christ. Amen? Amen. Let us now stand and sing our closing hymn. Hymn number 264, In the Cross of Christ I Glory.
Following our benediction, benediction, we do want to invite everyone to the Fellowship Hall uh, again to celebrate uh, Lonnie Schultz's 85th birthday and his family and the, the cake that they are providing. And so now let us receive uh, the benediction that it's found in Scripture. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. As you go in the protection of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.